folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Today is Halloween. Get around wearing your special costumes to go out for trick-or-treating and have a frightful bash as a monster mash party at night. <laughs> so I'm going to end my movie review for this month. This is indeed Halloween month, of course. But I will continue to do some more in November. Unless I have to post some more commercial breaks to, to go on the side of things. Well, who knows? <laughs> and this is indeed a special treat. An eye candy of sorts. Or even more. <laughs> yes, it's the equally bonkers of an insane plot device which is a sci-fi space horror vampire flick simply called life force in the blink of the eye the terror begins from visionary filmmaker the late great toby hooper who gave us the original the texas chainsaw massacre and controversy aside the original poltergeist which the reason i said that is because well we're not so sure if he is the true director of the movie they assume that it might be steven spielberg because after all he did wrote the screenplay and was the producer behind his creative mind and genius but nevertheless, I mean, I think he put a lot of his um, techniques aside for this film because it has a ubiquitous mix of, of vampires with zombies, a space movie, some humor in there filled with gratuitous nudity. But you got two cuts to be included too on this brand new. 4K release that comes with two Blu-rays, um, courtesy of Shell Factory, under its Screen Factory uh, label, because they put out a lot of great stuff, uh, both Blu-ray, DVD, and, and 4Ks aside. I was really lucky to pick this up for, for uh, in the same price of $22.96. It was worth the deal. But I'm glad, because they did finally use the original poster art exactly how it was when it came out in theaters back in 1985, which was um, in June 28th, 1985. Um, it was a box office bomb, and it got split reviews, half of which are negative from critics, but some of them gave some positives, People even calling this a guilty pleasure and all. Uh, but this is indeed uh, the first movie that Toby Hooper has signed a free picture deal with Canon. So this was, of course, the first movie to be shot in 70 millimeter. Uh, yes, it's in scope, uh, 2 by 35 or 39 to be exact. Um, Filled with uh, a 70 millimeter uh, six track Dolby stereo at the time. So that means you get to see this movie in glorious uh, big screen if you had to see this in the theater back in the day with incredible sound. Yeah. So this release, um, give or take, um, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but on the, on that basis of that level, it is a great release to finally own because I never did own any of the previous releases of this movie. The first time I saw Life Force was uh, back on HBO. I didn't see it in the 80s, though. I probably should have, but I was very young. And besides, if, if I had seen it, though... It probably would have been one of my first exposures to nudity. Because yes, you do get to see 
a girl with uh, big boobs and vagina. <laughs> And probably a little bit of uh, the two males, um, but you don't see their shalongs that much. Yeah, but it's mostly the female that we're seeing, who's uh, portrayed by French actress, uh, who's actually a ballet dancer named Matilda May, who went on to do the movie The Jackal, the yeah, the the American remake with Bruce Willis, Richard Gere, and Cindy Poitier. Uh, not the greatest uh, version we had to offer, but hey, it was nice to see Matilda May on screen. And I think she has done other films, too, to follow. Uh, but it also has Steve Wells back, who's been best known for his performance as, uh, yes, the, uh, the terrorizing serial killer named Charles Manson uh, in the, the miniseries Helter Skelter, yeah, named after the song by John Lennon. That's happened to be his favorite song. Yeah. Yeah, the serial killer who actually hired his followers to, to murder uh, Sharon Tate, the, the actress. Um, he also went on to do a film called The Stuntman. And uh, he even did the, the movie, surprisingly enough, um, he did... The Torchlight, uh, which was a, a romantic melodrama uh, that came out the same year as this film did. A very underrated film, but he, he's an excellent actor. Uh, I don't think, I think it was on DVD, but it's pretty hard to find, out of print. Uh, but it was on VHS. I'm not so sure if it was on Laserdisc, but it probably was. Uh, but it's pretty hard to find. I don't know if they have it on YouTube uh, fully, but if I ever find it, I'll, I'll look for it. Uh, but I've seen that movie before, and it was great. But he's great in this movie, too. Um, you also got Peter Firth, uh, who was from that TV show uh, Spooks. Um, they also have Frank uh, Finlay, who was... Best known for being in, in Laurence Olivier's uh, film meditation of Follow and The Key. You also got Patrick Stewart, uh, long before he went on to play Captain John Luke Picard in Star Trek The Next Generation. He was also in the movie Dune. So it's great to see him in this movie. And um, many others to follow. Yeah. Yeah, so this release, uh, yep, you can see Matilda May right there, as beautifully striking as she could be. I mean, no doubt about it, if anybody had seen this movie back in the 80s, I swear to God, everybody had wet dreams. <laughs> I mean, she is just luscious with eye candy right there. And yeah, you can see all, all the... The still shots of of Steve Wells back and, and Peter Firth, and then you see the chaos going around in London, and then you can see zombified uh, creatures. You know they were humans, but they're becoming vampires at this point on. It's it's such a crazy, insane movie, but it works in that level. Sort of like a 70 millimeter hammer film, as they described. <laughs> okay, so the so this one has the theatrical version only, sadly, and but it's it's a new 4K scan which was done last year of the original camera negative. So that means we finally get to see the TriStar Pictures logo, since this was the the North American distribution for Canon. Um, this was their second film that they distributed uh, after um, Break In to Electric Boogaloo. Uh, I think it was because um, at the time uh, Canon was uh, working together with MGM UA uh, to uh, 
distributed all the Canon films, so they, they wanted to be able to have more profit. But because of the controversial Bolero with Bo Derek, um, they refused because uh, given the fact that, yes, they would release the film with an X rating. Yeah, they wanted to avoid that because they won't be advertised and they want to make much money or or the fact that this this could really hurt um, the patrons around but of course they won't allow any uh, children to see the film it's true because it has tons of nudity in the movie so that's the problem so they had the so they had no other choice but have canon release it themselves and then and then they had to try to find a distributor, so they went for TriStar. So at that rate, uh, TriStar only had their domestic theatrical cuts. They had to cut it down to uh, an hour and 41 minutes, which is 101 minutes, to be precisely. Out of its uh, international cut, the one that was available overseas, that's the more definitive uh, cut that... Toby Hooper had provided his more preferred one that, that added more scenes so you get more of the story that's not as complicated as it seems so it's more precise it has uh, more gratuitous nudity in the movie and, and it does have more uh, gruesome scenes and, and there, there's some jokes and dialogue in there that I guess <laughs> You know, Americans are too strict to, to get the joke. I don't understand that. But that's the problem with us Americans. You know, we're always so goddamn strict. I mean, and oversensitive and everything. But it is politically incorrect for its time. But nowadays, if a movie like this was released today, it's going to cause a serious riot going around, which I hate that. I know, but hey, then again, you know, we were getting riots a lot with, uh, with everyone holding their picket signs uh, for for Tristar's release of Silent Night, Deadly Night, and they had to release the domestic cut while they had their international cut um, elsewhere because, you know, they didn't want to refer to Santa Claus as a serial killer and it could harm a lot of children, you know, take them bad influence and all that. Yeah, I just... I mean, it is a controversial slasher film for a holiday classic, but it wouldn't bother me. I mean, because I already knew that that it was a serial killer um, who's gone totally mental and all. You know, they have this mental illness that they have, and so they're, they're going to do a lot of crazy shit happening. But... Aside from that, I mean, there's been so many Christmas movies out there, okay, with Santa Claus, okay, so I'm fine with that. I mean, we even had a comedy, which I know people almost uh, went controversial for, which was Bla Bad Santa. And I went in with some low expectations, but to my surprise, it was hilarious. So, hey, I mean, it happens to everyone. Okay, <laughs> I know I'm talking a little too much, but that's fine. Uh, so, going to the side, yes, um, it, it is sadly that this is the only theatrical cut that they included on the 4K release. They didn't bother to put the director's cut included. I wish they did. I don't know why Shout Factory didn't have the nerve to do so, because uh, I found out that they now have a 4K uh, restoration on the director's cut, but it's only done on an interpositive not on the original camera negative, but that's fine. It still should have been on the 4K, uh, with the special features included, too. But I did watch the 4K, and despite it being the domestic cuts, with the TriStar logo fully intact, restored the way it was meant to be seen, uh, no Canon logo, unless it's in the end credits and the credits side, and... I mean, even though at the end credits it does have the Henry Mancini score, the more, this more arousing score that's that's more famous for, uh, that was in the international cuts, and they have all the entire score, whereas this cut just carries um, 
the um, yeah, because all, all this was done by the London Sympathy Orchestra. Join in with it. But for the domestic version, they eventually had additional uh, music musical cues by Michael Kamen and James Guffrey. So they wanted to go for a more darker and eerie score to it. Which Henry Rossini's score was already as eerie enough. But maybe they just want to make it in that sense. Yeah, although I really did enjoy the scores no matter what they did. Uh, okay. But the HDR, and they do have Dolby Vision included too. But I just watched it in HDR and it just looks incredible. Totally impressive. The way the transfer looks. It, it just looks so breathtaking. Having to see uh, shots of the special effects that they use. Yeah, the visual effects were done by John Dystra, while the makeup effects were done by Nick Malay. Yeah, they you were know, providing these uh, these creatures and of the zombified uh, characters and all, and or even when they when they suck the life force out of them. Yeah, that's where you see all these uh, flying. Um, Blue, blue uh, laser light beams all the way around the sky. Uh, just when the victim actually suck out their life force when they kiss them, so they don't suck their blood. They just go around to. It. And also to note that this is based on a novel by uh, Colin Wilson, which he generally disliked and disowned the movie completely. But he, because he felt that. His novel was totally butchered and just turned into a joke. And the same one. So this too um, also includes the theatrical cut as well. But it does have special features. Uh, the only thing that was missing is the vintage um, featurette that was included on the 2013 original release. Uh, that came out, um, which unfortunately is out of print. So if you had to get that release... Um, be my guess. But they have it used on Amazon um, for a much um, steeper price, maybe under it, you'll be lucky. But if you get it brand new, um, you're probably going to spend like uh, almost nearly a hundred. So I hate these prices. It's ridiculous. It's totally outrageous. Um. Anyway, but this does have uh, Dangerous Beauty, which is an interview with actress Matilda May. Yeah, as I explained, you know, she was a ballet dancer before she became an actress. And this was her first role, major role. And, and the fact that she had, she took the risk, even though she was sort of triggered at first by results. But still, she, she took the risk to actually be able to pose herself in the nude. Because... Um, most of the other models and actresses have turned down. They they were totally uncomfortable, but she was more confident to do so. I mean, she's she's a definitely natural beauty right there. I mean, she has a gorgeous body, no doubt. <laughs> I mean, something that will make guys you know swillward and you know and masturbate and all. <laughs> it's crazy, I know. And I gotta be perfectly honest. I mean, she's just stunningly beautiful, man. I, I just, what a body. Um, but she also had to speak um, some English in the movie because I mean she is French, so there are times when she had trouble trying to speak English fluently. So she she doesn't often speak English, just French. But I think it took some time for her to learn the language. So in order for her to get the part, so she'd be able to read the dialogue in certain scenes. Um, Space Vampires in London, which has an interview with the late great uh, Toby Hooper. He explains how he got the part. I mean, after signing a free picture deal with Menachem Golan and Yoram Goblis of Canon. And they got the opportunity for him to do... Um, not only that film, but also uh, Invaders from Mars, which I, which in my opinion was an 
awesome remake. I think it's an awesome remake. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, come on. You got the late great Lewis Fletcher as the teacher being so sinister and, and he she's always calling him always saying his full name David Gardner I'll get you I'll get you David Gardner <laughs> come on man it has a lot of fun humor and it poked fun and, and, and all and and it kind of got the, the style of something like what Poltergeist was doing uh, in, in the movie yeah the original of course well, I guess because he wanted the proof that, yeah, he is not a more confident director to, to challenge uh, those films. Yeah, just, he deserves a lot of respect. And he also went on to do The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, too. I mean, his uh, follow-up to his original, and even better, too. I, I love that one. That's where it introduces to, to all the actors, including... Um, the actress who played the stretch, yeah, very beautiful actress. Um, so you probably know who she is. <laughs> I love her too. Um, anyway, oh yeah, and also had Dennis Hopper in that film too. <laughs> okay, uh, then there's um, Carson Curse, uh, which is an interview with Steve Wells back. Yeah, he explains about. You know, his role when he played the part of uh, Colonel uh, Tom Carson, you know, who was um, the commander-in-chief of, of the space shuttle uh, Churchill. So he also talks about the, the cult uh, feedback that it had gotten over the years and in spite of the film not doing so well at the box office. And he really inspired it. I mean, he got to do... And had total respect for Matilda May, you know, having to have play the part and having to kiss, um, having to kiss her, and, and of course, almost um, this close to kissing um, Patrick Stewart in that scene, which underneath the body is actually her. <laughs> I mean, just just to have a confidence to do so, because I'm not so sure if, if the actor's gay. Or not. I don't. I don't. I'm not so sure about that. Um, so let's keep that aside. <laughs> and yes, it has the teaser, which is from the domestic release from TriStar, and has the theatrical trailer uh, from Canon. So that's the international cut, and it has the TV spot, only one, from the TriStar release. And the still gallery, which has a constant of movie stills, uh, behind the scenes uh, shots, uh, poster reels, um, even the even all of the uh, the special effects that they've done, and, and the actors and the crew, everyone involved. It's incredible. And this free is indeed the director's cut, and it's the only one you get to watch on the third disc of the Blu-ray, not 4K, sadly. But it is indeed a 4K uh, restoration uh, interpositive, um, even though it's not listed on, on the back of the 4K uh, release, but on the 4K case. <laughs> um, yeah, in fact, it's, it's the same as usual, too, uh, just so you know. And, it, and it's not a reversible uh, cover art either, so it's such a shame, but that's okay, because I like this better. That's how I remembered it um, as we speak. <laughs> yeah, and it says MGM, of course, um, and it has the Canon logo, print logo, but it doesn't have the TriStar logo on there at all, but whatever. Um, but it does contain the commentary by Toby Hooper, so that's great to hear his commentary. How oh, he was very impressed and, and all. And also have it's being moderated by Tim Sullivan. He also got auto commentary with makeup effects designer Nick Malay. That's being moderated by Michael Pfizer. So they explain how he, he throw in all the, the incredible details and all this other stuff that he put in. Try to make it look more like Nine of the Living Dead in a way. <laughs> Only, I mean, for the chaos scene in, in London. So, it's very impressive. Oh, and I'll just show you the, 
the disc inside on this this wonderful 4K uh, case. Um, there's a well, there isn't much grease on here. Um, there's a little bit of a stretch here, like maybe a little bit of a scratch, but nevertheless. Yeah, here's the disc. It just shows the earth for the 4K disc. And here's the eye for the Blu-ray. And and right here, it's just, uh, just a shot of bats that was inside the... Uh, that's inside the Haley's Comet, uh, the, yeah, the tunnel, all the way included inside. So. But, joking aside, it's it's a wonderful disc, and I'm just glad I finally picked this up after all this time. And I'm sorry I'm taking so long, because I'm 26 minutes ahead here, but I think it's going to be a lot longer than I thought. But here we go. Uh, the movie stars Steve Rell's back. Peter Firth, Frank Finlay, Matilda May, Patrick Stewart, Michael Goffhart, Nicholas Ball, Audrey Morris, Nancy Paul, Sidney Livingstone, John Halem, John Keegan, Chris Jagger, Bill Mallon, Jerome Rillis, Derek Benfield, John Wardnut, and John Forbes Robertson. Uh, yeah, they also got uh, Patrick Connor, Nicholas Donnelly, Julian Firth, no relation to Peter, and Richard Oldfield, uh, additionally <laughs> to the movie. Yep, it's based on a novel by Colin Wilson called The Space Vampires. But they had to change the name to Life Force, you know, just to protect that. Because it makes sense, because they suck out the life force out of them. It's written by David O'Bannon, who's the co-writer of Alien. He's joined in with Don Jacoby, the writer of John Carpenter's Vampires. He also did um, Evolution. Of course, uh, both of them together, they had wrote previously called the action thriller Blue Thunder with Roy Scheider from Jaws. Excellent movie, you know, the helicopters. Uh, but they went together to collaborate to do uh, Invaders from Mars, to join with Hooper. And then Dan O'Bannon also directed uh, The Return of the Living Dead the same year, which he also wrote uh, for Orion and Hemdale. And, yep, it's produced by Menachem Golan and Yoram Goblis of Canon Films, and it's directed by Toby Hooper, who gave us, of course, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Poltergeist, controversy aside, among other films that he's done in his career. The movie began set in space. We meet the entire crew of the joint British and American space shuttle called the Churchill, that's under the command of Colonel Tom Carlson, who's played by Steve Wellsback, where they explore an 150-mile spaceship that's hidden somewhere in the Halley's Comet. It's this greenish uh, comet that inside there's a vessel that has tons of desiccated bats all the way around this entire um, cave and tube. And underneath this utter cave, that's where we spotted um, all these crystal-like, uh, suspended animated uh, coffins, where it features three humanoids, all which are naked. Yes, we get two guys, both of which are vampires, and a space girl, also a vampire. It was just gorgeously sexy. You know, boobs, vagina area, and all. <laughs> yeah, and, and she also has a wonderful, uh, gorgeous face, too. Now I know why people started falling in love with her. Okay. Well, joking aside here. <laughs> or how it's presented. Boy, we're getting more... I can't imagine this here, <laughs> as I explained. Uh, 
the two vampires that are males are played by Chris Jagger and Bill Milan, and the space girl being played by Matilda May. Yeah. So anyway, they, they contain all three glass containers uh, that they just took out, the entire crew, and they just collected this one bat, all desiccated, of course. And then soon things have gone completely wrong when the entire crew has been killed, except for Carlson. But this is going to be more complicated to explain, because, to tell you the truth for the matter, was that at first he thought, okay, maybe he would have just destroyed the entire ship if everyone was dead, and that way he'll be the only one to survive. But it really turns out that one of them, or perhaps it might be just him, because I guess he got so hypnotic and and got smitten over the space girl. That, yeah, as you may have noticed too, um, the eye pupils of those vampires uh, are have a lot of uh, hypnotism right there, if you can see it up close. So that's kind of what led everyone in. And what happened was um, they all got in a trance and they sucked the life force out of their mouths. You know, they didn't go around sucking the blood out of their necks through their fangs. So this is a different story here. So yes, they drain out all the life energy out of their bodies and that's where they become totally frail, weak, bony becoming more of a skeleton and they do all these very strange um, bizarre uh, movements that they've done before they end up grabbing the next victim and draining out their their energy out of their bodies and although there was one scene where they took another human body and then sucked the life out of them and then became back to his own human self and that was crazy so, anyway, um, but the rescuers had discovered that the church hell has been gutted by the fire. Yeah, it's already been destroyed, which Carlson's the only survivor left that he just escaped from the space pod. And they found him in Pasadena, Texas, and he just eventually went to the European Space Research Center in London, England, which already, after their autopsy, um, the guards, uh, as well as the doctors, have been have drained all the life forms out of the, the space girl, which she had been awakened, and just escaped by you know by having to walk upstairs, you know, barricade the guards, and then ends up um, destroying the the glass, and went outside, continuing to go out and and continue to uh, kill all of these victims and end up taking um, their minds um, together into all the other humans. So now they're going to end up taking their bodies and minds and souls around underneath it all. I'm not making this up. I mean, this this is this is all in the story. And it's, it's crazy. Insane plot right there. <laughs> So at this rate, uh, Carson had just came, uh, he was having nightmares where he dreamt about the space girl and he fell in love with her, which revalues the truth that yes, he was the one who did let one of them out. And this is where he got, he was under the trance, you know, he got, he got so smitten, he ended up falling in love with her, but luckily she, she didn't take all the life form out of him it just eventually she just took uh, half of his energy and just decided to go around with anybody so that way now she's going to be going around taking over you know just to have her time which is going to lead to chaos going around uh, later on meanwhile we do meet uh, Colonel Colin Kane played by Peter Firth who's about to uh, 
do a news report about the discovery of, of these humanoids, you know, running around. Uh, the two males uh, eventually had took out those two guards and and eventually were in disguise, you know, because they had to take their clothes. They just used their machine guns and started shooting, you know, their bodies, but they're not killed. Yeah, blood, blood was coming out of them, of course. All these gun wounds and stuff. And that's where we begin to see how peculiar they were. Um, but during the lab, um, there, while you know performing surgery, they took one of the corpses. Uh, yeah, one of one of them actually were alive, and they were trying to, to see what's going on. And then this one, you know, took another uh, surgeon. All all the life form energy out of his body. You know, to become that creature and then ends up taking the other one and that guard eventually became normal but didn't last long they trap them inside they trap all the other ones and then next they found this one girl who's already been sucked out of it uh, by the space girl um, they test it out and eventually explodes you know with sand and, and dust it makes a matter of time when they had to go all the way to the psychiatric hospital in Yorkshire because um, Carlson just had uh, a vision after his nightmare. Um, they had to hire a, a hip, they had to hire um, a Dr. Hans uh, Falad. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, Falad was played by Frank Finley. He's a very expert in in life after death. Um, you know, he does study a lot of the humans, mythologically and all. Yeah, he collects a lot of specimens and everything. Um, he begins to, to talk to Carlson about uh, his experience, and then he begins to begin to see visions of this uh, young woman who's under the spell of the space girl. Who ends up picking up this uh, old guy? They they had a drive, and yeah, eventually she was spreading her legs. Uh, you can see her panties, or white lace, and the the guy was just putting the her hand on her, her leg till so they got into an accident. Or, and then later they've been taken straight to the psychiatric hospital in Yorkshire, where. That's where we meet um, Dr. Armstrong, played by Patrick Stewart, which we learned that, yes, she, she was, uh, he was actually under the spell of the space girl, even though the space girl was also under the spell of her and, and already attacked the guy. So they had to put in all these injections of um, certain uh, medicine that they had to use to actually be able to collect the samples of the powerful uh, life forms and life force span that's spanning around around the sky and, and around the ceiling where you see this light beam shooting around where the body is. Carlson actually makes contact, you know, through Dr. Armstrong's body, all knocked out of conscious and all, and, and it's, uh, he also joined in with uh, Dr. Leonard uh, Bueski is played by Michael Goffhard, um, which unfortunately he was killed. And they had to explain that uh, the entire uh, virus, as they claim to be, because it's becoming more of a pandemic or an epidemic, which is going to lead to the chaos that's happening in London. Yeah, throughout the entire street. So that means that. Yep, it's going to be one heck of a nightmare, <laughs> but it's insane. So therefore, uh, both uh, Armstrong and Boreski, all that blood was coming out of their faces. It looked like tons of vomit of blood that was coming out of their mouths and their nose and their eyes. Ugh. And then that's where it starts to reveal the space girl. Uh, drained in blood as she disappears um, 
managed to leave. Yeah, with a whole puddle of blood uh, in, inside the helicopter. So, yes, they had to go uh, straight to the office to be able to find out uh, if any of them had have gone already becoming the, the vampires and all the other creatures. Well, it eventually started to happen, and it started to spread even worse. And once they finally went to London, where they went to meet all, all the guards and and the entire army, because they were trying to find uh, this one special uh, sword. Yeah, this one sword uh, that uh, that Falad, uh, the Falad actually has, because he actually stabbed one of them. I'm sorry, I can't talk right on the name, but bear with me. But he just stabbed one of them, and now he's also under the life force himself. Like, he was probably the only one who was alive, but but not quite. He was just under it. So, Kane just shot him. Meanwhile, Carlson had decided to leave straight into the cathedral in London. So he'll be able to find a space girl, so that way he's going to be together with her to stop this madness from happening. And... Oh, wow. I mean, you basically see both of them actually driving around. They stole the, the trucks, and all, all these uh, all these bodies were going around. I mean, all the humans were already getting killed. Everyone was running away as fast as they could, so they don't get caught by, by the life force, getting all their lives being drained out completely. And, yeah, it, it was like total madness around and all the way around the um, the, <laughs> the double-decker bus, the, the subway station, um, all these numerous uh, places and there's even the castle in London, all of that. I mean, and then you see the, the light beam um, shooting around, flying around too, and then Cain eventually took the, the sword and just stabbed um, the last one, uh, well, the second last to last uh, male who eventually was, was already shooting all that, uh, that life force, uh, all this magical uh, force into his body. Uh, there was a dialogue that uh, said at the end, like you've seen, well, if you saw the director's cut, uh, he would be saying, "It would be uncomfortable if if you can kill me <laughs> right now." And then King was like saying, "Okay, I'll I'll do it." And he just stabs him straight into the heart, and then that's where he, he transforms into the bats, and then he explodes just right when he was trying to get into the cathedral, where he begins to spot. Um, both uh, Kane and the Space Girl together, you know, making love, sex, together, and then just tries to call his name out and just threw him the, the sword and ready to stab both the Space Girl and himself together into one big body. And now they just flew around straight into this collector that has this umbrella-like... Um, that's a tunnel that they got. So that's where they collect all the life force and everything. And it shoots them up all the way straight back to its place where they created another uh, crystal uh, glass container uh, all together. Uh, this entire coffin joined with even more. And, and now they're both together. And now hopefully the madness will end for sure. But I'm sure they're going to be cleaning up all the mess that they really made um, in London. Because soon it's going to probably happen the entire world and Earth. Yeah. And by the way, it was the St. Paul uh, Cathedral in London, <laughs> just so you know. Um, but yes, it's um, the orbit was actually called the Geo... Sequinatius orbit, uh, as we speak, that's shooting out of it, known as the collector. 
Okay. Oh, I'm talking so much. Um, oh, this is just one trippy horror flick that's also sci-fi, mixed blend of zombies, uh, vampires, uh, space film, with some humor aside and some drama. Oh, and, and filled with sex and nudity, uh, graphic violence, all the way around in this one movie and it's it's insane <laughs> and very complicated to explain too but if you watch the international cut you'll know <laughs> um, yes uh, a rousing score by Henry Mussini I mean this iconic score you'll never forget which goes like this do 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 eerie, um, irrational, um, but I know they want to go for a more horrified score anyway, so it makes sense. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, and I, I know they had to do a lot of changes with the story, too. I mean, I know they were going to go for something that's inspired by the novel and hoping maybe that would be the case, but didn't seem to work that way. Um, its budget for this film is about $25 million. I mean, this was a big budget film for its 70 millimeter uh, transfer, or which would be 65 millimeter to be exact. Um, so I don't think it doesn't blow up in some ways or another. Um, but, but I think it might have been. Um, and yes, I mean, there are some very intense scenes shown here and there. Um, so there are a bit of jump scares, but not as much. And I, I remember because it's like every time you see these shots and, and having to see the the score in, in these moments just really terrifies and, and it becomes more chilling than ever before. And that's how they did it. Um, the performances are are excellent, no doubt about it. I thought Steve Relsback was terrific as Carlson. I mean, you could definitely feel his energy, you know, that's being sucked out of it, but not too much. And he begins to have his own mind about what's happening. Like, he gets to see his own vision through the eye of, of the space girl about what she's been doing and, and trying to find a way to stop it. And uh, Peter Furf is just uh, outstanding as uh, Kane. I mean, he really does know his stuff and, and all. I mean, it's great to hear that, you know, you get a both American and a British uh, guy working together as a team. I love that. I wish there were more, but that's okay. Um, but that's the purpose of the story. <laughs> uh, but till the May... Oh, God. She's just... She's a knockout. Very sexy. Um, versatile and all. Um, I know she doesn't speak much uh, English, but she got some of the English dialogue um, within the film. But even if she didn't speak, I mean, she's still... She, she can really read your mind. <sighs> filled with eye candy and all. So, I mean, you can't go wrong with her. Uh, Frank Follet, um, I gotta say, he really uh, nails his performance uh, as a, an expert of of afterlife and life and life, human human lives and all. I mean, he's, he's just so darn it, but definitely uh, a nice touch because he almost looked like he came from out of a, a hammer film, <laughs> in a way, um, for, for his performance. I mean, it's definitely uh, 
very uh, versatile here. And it was really nice to see Patrick Stewart in the film, even though it was a small role, but hey, it's nice to see him for a while, for you knew what happened to him. And Michael Goffard's also great too. Um, nice to see some other cast members, even ones earlier or later in their career. Some of them might still be alive, some of them might be dead, I don't know. Um, but it really works so well. I mean, it is a shame that Toby Hooper could have been, um, and indeed, you know, have more respect, not only as a filmmaker, but also as a creator, too, because he really did his entire work on screen right there. Um, special effects done by John Dystra, who, of course, did Star Wars. Uh, I, I love all these shots that they've done. I mean, they use some blue screen effects, and they they mix it in with the miniatures of the entire London, which have been in desecrated and destroyed altogether within a huge blast. You know, most of these uh, these humans are already you know burned by the fire and all. They've done their own stunts to do so uh, for the stunt people. And they also had um, a lot of crew having to blend it in with it, with all the other actors and other extras, too. Yeah, they were under the chaotic uh, madness in the streets. And um, through all these other tunnels and the subway stations, uh, double deckered, all these other places, you know, all practical. So there's no CGI involved, folks. They did it all by camera. Um, techniques and and they blend it in I, I'm sure they probably use a computer to blend it in but they also use a lot of camera techniques and other stuff and all the other incredible special effects of the light beams flying around and all this other stuff um, and also um, Nick Malay um, who supervised the uh, the makeup effects on on the characters you know all look like they've been <laughs> indeed infected they all become like zombies in a way you know blood coming out of their face you know they're all gray, gray faced and all that's what i noticed too and then some of them look like you know they were ready to become you know skeletons you know all all the life force has been drained out becoming more frail I mean, wow it's really incredible um but I thought Toby Hooper did a great job directing this, um, and it's a perfect follow-up to Invaders from Mars and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. And and David O'Bannon and Don Jacoby's screenplay is uh, exhilarating as it should be, even though yes, it's it's kind of ridiculous, but that's okay because you have it all in one film. Wow. <laughs> I wish it was a bigger hit, though, um, during that summer. But I guess if they have used the international cut instead of being cut down to size, but I think it's due to avoid the X rating, then I think the film would have flowed a lot better, and I think it would have had made more money, and maybe it would have had the respect it deserves. Um, so, with it, its budget, it only made $11.6 million um, in the U.S. alone, so yeah. Well, it's probably the last film where they, where TriStar did team up with Canon, so. So, it just didn't make it up for that afterwards. Oh, well. But, nevertheless, um. Even with its flaws and all, and, and its silliness, its craziness, but you just can't help it but love it. Um, I've been surprised Gene Sisko loved this movie, so he called it a guilty pleasure. I still think this is just a total eye candy, bonkers of a sci fi vampire horror flick. That it's really insane to do. Uh, especially in the 80s, but you can do anything. 
But hey, we had a movie called Malignant last year, and it was just like that. Well, sort of. But in this day and age, I mean, who, who would have expected to do more? I mean, the, I guess the only thing that was missing was gratuitous nudity. <laughs> All right. So that's Life Force, and I give the movie... What the hell? Four and a half stars. Just for the, for the sake of it. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and have a happy and safe Halloween, and I'll see you later. Bye.